This is one of my favorite questions to ask on the podcast. What do you think are the common traits of high performers? I think it's important to have a chip on your shoulder. I mean, you obviously need a lot of ambition. So to a point where it's almost delusional, you have to believe that you can create a reality that is different from the one that exists today. And that requires a lot of tenacity, a lot of vision, a lot of ambition, and just you have to be willing to make sacrifices. Yasin Sabu is the co-founder of Parker, a corporate card-focused fintech company targeting e-commerce brands. In 2023, the New York-based startup announced a massive $157 million funding round across both equity and debt to accelerate their impressive growth. In this episode, we cover Yasin's path towards financial independence, lessons learned from Y Combinator's Paul Graham, balancing health and hard work, and the reality of high performers. Welcome back. Today, we have Yasin Sibu, co-founder and CEO of Parker, joining us. Thanks for joining today, Yasin. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me. So you guys are both asking me, like, where do you want to start with this conversation today? And I've been fascinated because I think Yasin is one of the most introverted people we've had on the podcast today. And he's someone who I just look at. I'm like, this man moves in silence and I never know what's going through his head, but he's built like an absolute behemoth of a business. So like, I want to just unpack your, I want to unpack like your mental models in terms of how you operate. Because I feel like you're a man of few words, but your brain is always turning. Sure. All Am right. I the only it's one who feels intro. that way? <laughs> Am I the only one intro. who feels that way, no, or no, do you it's, agree? It's true. We work with like a lot of teams, and I remember going to your office, and you were just the chillest, slowest speaker I've ever talked to. But everything you said like was a decision. I specifically remember that interaction. <laughs> really? and I was like, this is very different than most people I talk to. He thinks differently, and he's. I think he's very articulate with every single word that comes out of his mouth. Right, we'll stop gassing you up. Answer. Let's hear it. Oh, what do you guys? No, it wasn't even. It wasn't even like a question. <laughs> I think I just want to understand like. Um, how you think about like as an operator, like you're very much someone who leads by example. Like, is your co-founder similar in that sense? Or are you guys completely opposite? Um, I would say my co-founder is even more of an inspiration than I am to the team because he he is the single most disciplined person I've ever met. So my co-founder, like I said, meditates five hours a day, is up at between five, probably around five in the morning every day does his meditation for a couple hours, goes to the office and works like five hours. Yeah. So you'll meditate for a few hours early in the day and a few hours um, before sleep. What's like the target of that? Have you talked to him about it? Like, is it so he can be like disciplined? Well, hold on. Before we, before we dive into the target of that, walk me through a day in your life. Like it's what time are you waking up? What are, what does a day look like? Cause I want to compare and contrast yeah, the two. So <laughs> So yeah, I don't, I don't really think the time at which you wake up makes a difference to your success, like things like that. But usually up around 8, 7.45 to 8.30, that range. Then, uh, you know, I'll go to the gym, get my workout in for around an hour. Then I'll work for a few hours, eat, work some more, and just end my day around like 8, 9. 9 p.m. It's Are there any weird. non-negotiable daily habits? Showering, brushing my teeth. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good one. The usual. No, but I think at this point, it's just, I think it's just a matter of doing the, the important work every single day and making sure that you're getting the obvious things done, things done. And, you know, I think it's easy to get caught up in detailed work or things that seem like they matter, but don't really. I feel like, so right before this, you were telling me how the team has grown, how you guys are really scaling right now, moving to an office, which you're probably going to have to expand soon. What are, as the team has grown and now you're managing more people, working directly with really senior leadership, what are the few decisions that you have to get right on a daily basis or weekly basis? I think at our stage, it's less so daily and weekly, it's more, and it's more so about making the right key hires. And for us, the right key hires are executives. So once you bring in the right executives in the business, then you, um, there are many things in the company that start unfolding in a way w in, in which you, you don't have that much control. So the positive here is that if you hire someone who's significantly better than you, then those decisions that are out of your control turn out to be better than the ones you'd make yourself. So I think vetting those people out um, well in the beginning is important. And so, but on the other hand, if you make the wrong hire, then those decisions will compound over time to bring the business in a direction, direction you don't want. 
So what's important is spending enough time with those key leadership hires to actually make sure you're you're well aligned on what you're trying to accomplish. And how has your hiring process evolved from like your early days of your first few hires now to to making like very expensive like leadership hires? I think one is in the beginning we wouldn't make the uh, the KPIs. So it's sort of we wouldn't make it clear what our expectations were out of the person so we wouldn't sit down and like think through hey these are all the things we want this person to accomplish in the year and this is their mandate we'd kind of have you know just be like oh we need an engineer and then we'd hire a couple engineers and then make the hire but we didn't have the right test we didn't have the right it was just you know it was just based on gut and we were moving quickly and just we're hiring people that we knew as we brought in executives they've actually shown us how to build the right processes so I'd say right now, step one is make it very clear what you want out of the candidate, which is something that you have in the job description. And I think the other thing, too, is we have we have our own internal vetting processes. So, you know, like, let's say we're hiring, I don't know, give me give me a role like a product manager. Right. So we have like very clear tests that test for all the attributes we'd want to see in a product manager. And one thing that's interesting is um, the processes are so good that we could identify talent that's you wouldn't you know you wouldn't necessarily think that person's very talented from the resume right so you you know like usually i think before we'd look at a resume and say oh wow this person worked at xyz company but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have the skills you need how do you how do you vet for work ethic and speed of deliverables or speed of shipping we test for that in case studies so that's how it comes off so for example recently we were interviewing uh for cfo and so one of the things we did is we gave the cfo candidate a 90 minute case study that they'd have to do and that's a proxy for how quickly they'll work we also believe that how you do one thing is how you do everything so if you you know if you're slow on that it's likely that you'll be slow on other things and then also just from interactions with someone you could kind of vet out how they they think about things but i think for that the best way to tell is at the reference stage and you can ask questions on reference calls that they'll sort of give you a sign of whether the person's a slow worker or fast worker what are the traits that are most important to you and every individual that you bring on to parker number one is always initiative it's very difficult to work with at a startup to work with people who don't have initiative and require to be um managed a lot or told what to do. So we want people who are very proactive on like discovering what the priorities are and then getting up to speed and just getting work done. That's number one. It sounds obvious, but there are a lot of people who once they're hired, they'll just sit there and wait to be told what to do and not do anything otherwise. So I think initiative is very, very important. Second thing is how easy the person is to work with. So there are people who are just um, very talented, but they're not, they're not great collaborators. Why? Because they tend to be very attached to their ideas. You know, they're not, you know, I think it's, I think oftentimes it's an open mindedness thing or like a flexibility of mind thing where they just, they're not very receptive of other people's ideas or other people's w- ways of working. So yeah, we try to keep it simple. I think those are the two most important things. How did you have to change as a founder and as an operator from like the 12, 10, 12 person phase, which I think we're both in right now. So this is like a very top of mind question for me. And moving to what you guys are almost like 35, 40 people. Like how have you had to change as an operator? What have you had to stop doing? That maybe was like a bad habit that worked when you were 10 people that just doesn't cut it anymore. I think it goes back to the executive thing where you have to trust your executive that they'll manage their teams. So one thing you have to learn is, as a founder, it's very tempting to try to kind of just tell people exactly what they need to be doing. But you can, what you say holds a lot of weight. So you can easily fuck shit up by just going to someone and saying like, hey, I think this and that. And then you, you end up confusing the team and derailing plans. So I think like, I think understanding hierarchy becomes more important. I think in the uh, I think in the earlier early stages, you always want to keep the structure 
flat in some ways where people um, can communicate to you the problems and you can get kind of a bird's eye view of what's going on in the business and you want to make sure everyone's being heard. But when it comes down to execution, I think that's where the hierarchy becomes more important. So that's, that's something that's changed for us over time. But we're still, I mean, we're still a small team, yeah. relatively speaking. When, when something goes wrong, say, you know, you guys work with consumer brands, say in one of your accounts, something goes wrong, maybe the team's not delivering or the product breaks, or something happens. Um, I think in our stages, when that happens, I still like, I, I still have the bad habit of like jumping in and I'm like, all right, how can I help? How can we fix this? And have you had to like train yourself to not do that anymore? So that when it has to do with customer issues, I'll still take a look, mm. but I, I'll never, I'll, I'll, I'll still intervene. I think that's something <laughs> that I think that's, I think that's customers are everything though. Yeah. So that one I think is like yeah. the one area where mm. I would, I would hope even at the highest level, people are like still wanting to intervene. But I think the thing that I'm hearing is really just that like your decision-making model had to elevate as your team was growing, as your company was elevating. Like you have to be better about prioritization. Like, cause if you're doing one thing that is at the expense of the other things you could be doing. And obviously there's a million things going on all the time. Yeah. I still think it's important to review everything and just make sure that things are going in the right direction. What do you think the right direction is? But overall, you, I mean, you want to give people a sense of ownership and you remove that sense of ownership if you're micromanaging. Mm -hmm. And then if someone's just not executing at expectation, then they're just not, they're just not the right fit, right? I think, I don't, I think the answer is not, hey, micromanage. I think the answer is, hey, you're just, you know, that person's not the right fit for the company. You're yeah. fired. <laughs> Did you guys have like a clear North Star vision from day one or a few months in that you could like align key leadership hires around? Because I'm realizing right now, like as we look to hire senior executives, we don't have that yet because we're just still like very functional. Like, hey, we solved this specific problem. But I'm realizing the need for that is like, if you want to bring on good people, there needs to be something much bigger than just like, the problem you're solving on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, we've always had a, a North Star and a clear vision from when we started. Mm. I think what's changed is how we'll execute towards that vision. That's iterated over time, but the, the vision has always more or less stayed the same. What is that vision? We wanna be the financial hub for the digital economy. So basically the way we think about it is the internet's created this unprecedented opportunity for people to become financially independent. And the best vehicle to do that today is really by starting an, an internet-based business. And there are different kinds of internet-based companies you can start today. E-commerce is the sort of one of the most accessible ones and the one where there's just a lot of people doing it. And so our approach has been to really like focus on this one vertical and build the, uh, the best financial products for them. So really what we realized when we were building our own e-commerce or other kinds of internet-based businesses is if you look at, like it, the internet's been around for 20 plus years, but there's still, and there's a ton of companies and products that have been built around solving the needs of internet businesses. Like you can just look at Shopify and how massive a company that is today. But if you look at the financial space, really, there's no, um, there's no company that you can pinpoint to and say, hey, this company helps me understand my financials in real time in a very easy way. This company is where I go to to get access to the financial products I need to scale my business. So we really want to like just own that category and be that company. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's you had the institutions and the banks were like the first wave into fintech. And now it's like which progressive startup is going to be the one that successfully like derails or becomes the new norm to your point like the new north star of how yeah, to be able to right. do that that's right if you think about the banks and the incumbents it's they don't have so they have the basic they're like good enough products but they haven't really they don't really serve the needs of they don't they don't really get the internet internet economy yeah. that well right so no but i i think there's two two points to it in my opinion the first one is it's money so like people treat money different than anything else, right? Like the thought of handing your money over somewhere else or someone else being in control. And I think the second one is that the larger the company gets, as you guys know, the harder it is to iterate. So you have these massive banks who have meetings about meetings about meetings just to like entertain the idea of doing something innovative, which is why they 
I don't think they're going to end up being the ones at the finish line with businesses like yours that are like really trying to disrupt them across the board. Yeah, that's right. Um, I'm curious about your life away from Parker. Like what, what do you, like, what do you do? What do you do when you're not building this company? Yeah, I like, I like traveling a lot, but I don't travel as much as I, as I like recently. Um, read, I'm a big read. So I used to read like an insane amount. So I'm a big, I love information. Like I love digesting new information. Like I'm a, definitely an information junkie. Like it's, I just love reading, learning about new things. I think, um, no, I think recently something that's been interesting to me is just observing how, um, and I've talked to you about this a lot, right? So I think if you look at the, if you look at the world of people who are trying to get rich off the internet, I think you can dissect it into two, two kind of spheres, right? So you have the kind of like bootstrap world where you have people building agencies, you have people building e-com businesses, bootstrap SaaS, being YouTube creators, all this stuff. And then you have the institutionalized world, which is called the world of venture-backed companies, right? So a lot of, the, a lot of people have, have good success in the bootstrap world, but if you look at the biggest outcomes, they've come from like, you know, the venture world. And so something that I'm very curious about that I'm learning a lot more about now is really how to bridge that gap because I'm seeing a lot of really good um, marketing tactics that people from the bootstrap world call it are doing that I see not being utilized in the, in the venture world or like, you know, like the, the tech world that I'm from. And so I think if I can apply some of these tactics what Parker's doing could be pretty promising. So I think on my free time, just doing a lot of research on that has been interesting. I think that's such an interesting point about the marketing tactics, and I'm curious if you agree with this or not, but I think one of the limitations around what some of those bootstrap type businesses are doing from a marketing perspective and what the institutional venture back side are doing is there's no red tape around like how vulnerable you are, how you talk about things, how you do things, when you don't have investors, when you don't have a board, um, do you feel like that has any sort of limitations in terms of like how progressive you can become with like marketing with an institution backed business? I'm trying to see if the, um, if the limitation is more imagined than reality, because at the end of the day, you are working to build a successful company and you want, you want to build something that changes the world. And so if there's a strategy that you can, you can take that helps you achieve that goal, I don't think it's, I don't think it's really a problem. Yeah, I guess investors, all they care about is the amount of money you give them back at the end of the day. I don't um, care how you get there. On that note, like we talked about setting a vision or, or North Star and then putting a mix of people and capital in place to get there. How, do you, how have you guys thought about the capital side of the equation? Because I know you guys have raised capital multiple times, I think. Yeah, the capital side is basically an exercise in relationship building and building trust with the right investors over time. Mm. And then finding investors who actually believe in the vision and want to back it up. So the venture model is VCs aren't looking for a business that's going to sell for $100 million one day. They're looking for that $10 billion exit. And so you need to find basically the believers and the people who see how this company can be worth that much one day and how their capital is basically an accelerant to that, to that, to that becoming a reality. How did you go about the process of raising, or I guess walk us through like what you've raised um, and different, different approaches you've taken or like learnings that you've had since the first round to the most recent one? I would say my general approach is always to keep, that, keep things very simple and not overcomplicated and break things down to what the mechanics of a process really are. So if you think about um, raising money, raising money is having a conversation with an investor and convincing them that it's a valuable opportunity and then getting them to send you a term sheet. And so that's a matter of getting the right introductions to those investors, setting up the right presentation, and then creating the right dynamics such that they actually want to invest. So for the introduction, it's just tapping into my, basically making a list of all the investors who'd be interested in this business 
than having a list of all the people I know who can get me in touch with those investors, asking for introductions, and then making sure that I'm communicating very clearly what the opportunity is, and then building a relationship with that investor over time. So they essentially built confidence in our ability to execute. That, that last component, that, I mean, it's essentially like a trust component. Yeah. Like if I give you $4 million, are you gonna screw me over, basically? Yeah. And so that's the more, I think, qualitative one here. I'm curious to get your take too. Once you found the right people, I think you pitched the right vision or convinced them in the right way and they're ready to sign. What is that qualitative part of it? Like, how do you build those relationships? How do you build that trust from your experience? And I'm curious to get yours too. I think the way you build trust is you have enough touch points over time where you're, you're repeatedly executing on the things you say you're going to do. So if I say, hey, we're gonna reach these numbers and we're gonna launch these products. And every time I say that, we do it, then the investor is like, okay, well, know this guy, this team for a year, got into know people on the team. Every single point in time, they've just basically executed against their plan. So, you know, this is a team that I want to back because if I don't back them, then they'll keep executing and I'll miss out on, uh, on what these guys are doing. Is part of that patience in developing that relationship? I'm not trying to rush anything. Yes, I would say though the first, so the first big fund that invested in Parker, it's not like I knew the guys for, you know, years or months. Yeah. They kind of took a bet, you know, they just, they met us, we had the right introduction, the introduction spoke highly of us, and within a couple of weeks they made a decision. So it's not like we knew those guys for years ahead of time. But then I think what led us to give us more money over time is they just saw how we repeatedly executed against the plan. Have you found that the way you manage these relationships has had to change as there's been more zeros added to the end of the number? You know, like when you're raising a pre-seed call 500K and now you're like at what, you raised the Series A in your last round? Now you're having conversations of 5, 10, 20 million. Like, have you seen a shift in the dynamic of those dialogues versus when you were at the earliest stages? Uh, I would say it looks pretty similar. Mm, it's, it seems pretty similar to what it was. I don't think it's changed that much. I just think the, the, the relationship management is very similar. I would say what's changed is just what's being prioritized in the business. So I think early on it's more narrative-driven and opportunity-driven. As you scale, it's more metrics-driven. What keeps you up at night about the business? Like if Parker fails, why? Parker fails, it's just because I didn't work hard enough. How do you keep up the, how do you keep up the pace after, over the course of like multiple years and multiple years to come? How do you keep, what do you mean? How do you keep the pace? The pace and the energy. Because I feel, again. Like avoiding burnout, you mean? Yeah. Like we're, you know, I think we're both what, like a third of the size that you guys are right now. And we've been doing this for a year, year and a half or something. And the biggest learning I think for me has just been like showing up with a ton of energy every single day to every interaction and pushing the pace. Does that get tiring sometimes or is that second nature? Um, I think the way I've done it historically is I'll just, so I've never, I've never taken a true vacation where I'm just turned off from the business. So that I've never done, but there'll be times where I'm, we're operating a little more slowly, just like, you know, I'll be away, but generally speaking, I think you have to, if you want to win big, you just need to keep the pace pretty strong mm. for a long time. So for us, for example, with Parker, Milan and I were working very hard for a couple of years without things breaking out. And no matter what, we were still working just, I mean, you have to work on, you have, you have to work on the smart, on smart too, right? So it's not just... A matter of hard work but in terms of pace we were very consistently going after what we wanted for like I think two and a half years before things started working as well as we wanted them to I also feel like as an entrepreneur the one luxury you do have is the ability to make decisions that you want to make in terms of like I need to close my laptop today or I need to like reset or find those things that allow you mentally to like keep going because it's obviously a grind. I think 
to your point, I don't remember the last time I went on vacation, I was successfully able to like not check my email for like three days consecutively. Like the thought of that gives me so much anxiety. Yeah, I don't for think better that, or for worse, but I don't think the vacation thing is what's necessary. I think it's more so about usually if you're burning out, it's because you're you know, you haven't made the right high there's something operationally that's broken that's leading you to lose focus, or it's that you're not taking care of your health. So taking care, care of your health is paramount, right? You want to you want to make sure you're sleep you have you know decent sleep, you're eating well, that you're doing you're exercising, you're doing all those things. If you're not taking care of your machine, things are going to break down. You stopped drinking, didn't you? Did I make that up? Yes. I made that up. No, no, I stopped drinking. Oh, I th- yeah, yeah, I thought so. Yeah, mostly. Were were, <laughs> were, there, were there specific moments that not that you burned out, but you realized, like, hey, I'm not functioning or I'm not driving the pace as much as I want, and so I'm going to protect my health more? Was that a learning over time or from day one? You're like, I know i got to protect my health and I'm going to do it. Uh, there was definitely a time <coughs> when we were starting out where I had to really take care of my health. So I had, there was a time where I had some pretty bad health issues. When This was bef- even before we raised the seed round. Mm. Um, but since then, no, there's been nothing dramatic where I just couldn't. Can you talk to us about that? Sure. I had, uh, <laughs> had like mercury poisoning when I, was, when I was in my early 20s. So I just could not, it was very hard for me to focus. So I was trying to like build this business while I was poisoned. And then I realized what was going on because essentially I went from studying some of the most complicated subjects in the world, studying physics and computer science, it's building these other businesses, killing it. And all of a sudden, I just could not focus on anything. I couldn't function on anything. And so that's when I had to look into what was going on in my health. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a crazy How time. do you get mercury poisoning? Is that a stupid question? I don't know. <laughs> I've never met someone in my life. What, were, what does that even like? What's mean? like the manifestations yeah. of that? Like brain fog? Like you couldn't... It's like... Very severe brain fog, huh. like very severe, like you're just, you're just not, the, it's like, um, it feels like your brain is paralyzed. How did it, how did you get it to go away? It was like a medication thing? Yeah. That's so interesting. I've never heard of that. It's like before. supplements, Medicaid, it, it was That's pretty wild. intense. Yeah, I've never heard of that before. Superpower.com. There you go. Plug for Jacob. <laughs> um... So the name of the podcast is Turning Pro. The concept of it generally is around like moments in your life where you take things to the next level. Think like getting up from a poker table and going to one that's more high stakes. Like what were a couple moments in your life where in your own mind you were like, I'm, I'm becoming a professional now taking things to the next level? I think it's when I internalized that the, one of the most important things I had to do as a founder was focus on fundraising. And that if I had to, if I wanted to build a massive company i needed to have a lot of capital to do it and so something switched in my mindset where i I thought hey um instead of just being focused on the day-to-day operations i need to focus on meeting the right investors and convincing them of this opportunity because this thing will not get big without the right amount of capital Do you have any advice for people listening who are maybe first time founders or early founders just around the stigma of raising money, like the mental model to use to know if it's something you should or shouldn't do? Because I think there oftentimes there's this this idea that people think that like raising money is the way to quantify how successful you are or how great your company is. But a lot of businesses don't actually need to go that route. Yeah, I think most businesses actually don't need to go that route. I think what's important to. uh understand if you're raising money as a founder is you're sacrificing short-term liquidity for a payout in the long run. So let's say you have a profitable SaaS business that you're running that, you know, if that business is cash flowing month over month and you're pocketing that money for that lifestyle that for building the lifestyle that you want, the day that you raise institutional capital, that's something you can't, uh, that's something you can't really do anymore. So I think the, and I also think raising money is not the goal. It's just, it's just capital, right? The goal is to actually build the business and gener- generate revenue. I think if you're, I think for us, we were building a fintech. So it was impossible to have this model without, venture, without a, a substantial amount of capital, 
which we actually saw as an, as an edge, right? Because we knew that, hey, someone can't bootstrap what we're doing. And so our ability to raise money is actually a competitive advantage here. So I think that's how I would think about it. But generally speaking, I think if you're just starting out as a founder, I view, I view playing the raising money game as kind of almost trying to play the Olympics of business. Mm -hmm. And so if you're starting out, it's, it's probably one of the Wor it's probably one of the worst things you could be doing, to be honest with you. I'm yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. No, I mean, I think it's I think it's accurate though. Yeah. It's not the first thing that you should be thinking about. It's like, you know, get through the mud and then figure out if you need the money to keep going or not. Yeah, yeah. I don't think uh, I don't think it's the first thing you should be thinking about. I think the first thing you should be thinking about is. Well, first of all, it's like you have to build your skill sets. <laughs> Second, you want to find a way to sell those skill sets. Third, you want to make sure there's actual demand for what you're building. You want to make sure you get, it's like, you don't have a business until you have customers. So like step one is get customers. How did you, the, I don't think I've actually talked to you guys about this. Martin may have mentioned it, but all of a sudden, I feel like overnight I started to see Parker everywhere like a year and a half ago or something like that. And there's definitely been waves of e-commerce infrastructure or fintech infrastructure or SaaS. And I think like the old way of how maybe Clavio and Postscript and other companies came about was a completely different go-to-market motion. And the first time I heard about you guys was like hosting parties and dinners paired with a great brand and a really damn good product that customers seem to like. So what did you guys do differently that seemed to have worked? I didn't want to run ads and I wanted our CAC to be super efficient. Mm -hmm. And I realized that what, so I was, I was building these e-commerce businesses before and I knew that something that appealed to founders was lifestyle. So I know that what a lot of, what a lot of these business owners are really after is creating a lifestyle of freedom and they want to tap, they, they want to have access to cool experiences. And so I knew that, um, hosting these, these kinds of events that, that they wanted to be a part of would be a far more effective strategy to, um, to building relationships than targeting ads or even just doing pure sales. And I knew, so what, the thing I knew about Parker was that I knew the product was really good and I knew the market wanted it. Our issue is we just needed to build trust, right? Because uh, if you're building a financial product, it's important for people to trust you. So the initial strategy was really to get the sort of call it the top brand owners to really like what we're doing and speak for what we're doing. And I knew that the way to, to speak to them was really by hosting these cool events. You guys have like really pushed the limits on that too in terms yeah. of creativity. You've done, like, wasn't there like an, a, a racing, car racing like activity that you guys did? Yeah, there was car racing, there was Carbone in New York. There was, yeah. Hell yeah. I'm curious, every growth investor that I know and that I talk to, talks about like this is like series a plus series beyond um that any mature company needs to have a repeatable go to market ocean and a repeatable way to acquire customers at scale and that's when a series b investor will come in right and so go to market is obviously very different like again maybe event scale i'm not sure and i think events are really important to build trust early days with that first pilot cohort has that motion had to change over time maybe towards a uh, you know, traditional enterprise sales motion or other motions? So we were always doing outbound sales and outbound sales is just known as a scalable strategy. Mm -hmm. I think early on you have to do things that don't scale and you have to do things differently. You have to think about ways to get to your customers that others aren't doing. And so doing the event strategy was very effective early on. And there's actually, there's actually, uh, I can't talk about it yet, but there's, something we're going to do around events that's going, that's going to feel like a more embedded experience into Parker. And I think that's going to be quite scalable. When's the launch? Working on it now. In the T works. TBD, yeah. Are there like founders you look up to or like books you've read that have really like impacted the way you operate? Or just mentors in general, I guess. Um, I think something that's influenced me a lot are Paul Graham's essays. So Paul Graham is the founder of Y Combinator. He started a company called ViaWeb that he sold to Yahoo in the 90s, I think 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. And 
he, he founded Y Combinator, which is the most important startup incubator in the world. And if you just look at the companies they've backed, it's, it's just insane. So I was very lucky to raise money from Paul Graham very early on and to have had a couple of conversations with him. I'd say that his essays, have, his essays basically gave me the playbook and blueprint of how to build Parker early on. And then I think there's a book called The Sovereign Individual that's been pretty influential on me, and it talks about basically this concept of how the internet will enable this new class of people that kind of act as like sovereign individuals. And so freedom's a very important value of mine. So that book has had an influence. And then there is, um, I, think, I think Zero to One is also a pretty good, you know, it's, it's very popular, but I think it's a very good book uh, to read. Were there any anecdotes from the Paul Graham essays that like stick out to you? Yes, do things that don't scale. That's, that's a big one. And then just the emphasis on everything he well, says. Well, now we know why they did the events. Love that. Yeah, everything he says is actually very simple and clear to understand. I think what I've learned from his essays is just the importance of clarity of thought and the importance of simplicity. So, I mean, he has an entire essay on doing things that don't scale early on, right? Because when you're an early stage company and no one knows about you, you have to go to the extra mile to get people to listen to what you're doing. Otherwise, you'll just, you'll just be noise. When I, uh, when I graduated from college, I went straight into VC in San Francisco. And like two months in, somehow I weaseled my way into like the investor side of things for demo day. And after I went up to him, he was in like a sandals and shorts. Oh, yeah. Like some ridiculous like Bahamian <laughs> fit, and, which is apparently like his fit. Um, and I went up to him and I shook his hand. I was like, man, I'm so excited to be here. Like uh, I, I read all your stuff and I, I moved to Silicon Valley because of you. And he, he was like, oh, cool. What are you doing? I go, I'm a VC. And he was like, why? <laughs> and it still stuck with, and I did VC for like four years after. But finally, I took that advice. Um, but again, like that, uh, very blunt questions of like, why would you do this? Yeah, um, yeah. And I think most of his advice is like that. Yeah. Um, and like taking that face value. He knows a lot about e-com, by the way. Really? Like way more than you'd think. I mean, he started, he started a predecessor to Shopify. That's what ViaWeb was. Oh, really? He knows a lot. That guy's yeah. forgotten more about it than we'll ever know, I guess. When I spoke to him, I was very surprised by how much he knew. Is he dropshipping right now? He's like, he knows about... like <laughs> dropshipping He knows what dropshipping is. He understands the model quite well. Like, you wouldn't... Because you wouldn't, he has a PhD from Harvard, yeah. so you wouldn't expect him to know about that world, but he does know a lot about it. Paul Graham, dropshipping yeah. king. I think that's just a byproduct of curiosity, though. Yeah. For it's sure. like... Guys like that just find a way to, they, like, I think you're similar in the sense that you find a topic and you just, like, go down a rabbit hole for, like, weeks and months at a time and just come out as a, not a subject matter expert, but, like, people don't expect you to be able to sit and have, like, a very intelligent conversation about something that you surprise them and you're able to. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I'm curious for you right now, I guess this is, like, real-time riffing on your go-to-market because you're starting to share a lot about it, which is awesome. Obviously, this podcast, but your other creator series and other work you're doing, um, how are you thinking about go-to-market for Platter, um, whether it's events, but also different type of events? Yeah, I think uh, they have. De Parker has definitely been an inspiration around the events piece. I mean, what you've seen, and I've obviously talked to Martin a ton about it, and I've been to like a lot of these events with a ton. There's only a couple like people who are doing events. I would say in New York that are like the cornerstone of all the events, mm. uh, and so I think events is definitely something that I want to try. Uh, I think the the relationships, at least in the New York City community, seems to be very like incestuous and small. But the thing that I'm still trying to figure out is like scaling beyond this community. Mm -hmm. As it relates to events, particularly, I know a couple of people who do event series like across different cities in the U.S. Um, for us, candidly, I think the go to market is still something that we're we're evolving over time. I mean, it's we're recording this now, probably like six to eight weeks before we're actually going to be launching uh, the new branding. We have a marketing plan in place in terms of how we think about wanting to roll that out. Uh, but I would say a lot of it is more digital um, in terms of like 
we're like a partnership program just by nature of where our product is positioned. Uh, but I've definitely been someone who's been more and more interested in the events because I think something I've learned is that being able to build these in-person relationships, uh, a lot of my success on the sales side has come from feeling like I'm working with friends and not like feeling like I'm working with customers. Yeah, I think that's a gift. I think that's rare. Yeah, but again, it's like to your point, do things that don't scale is that that's not going to be the thing that gets me to building a, you know, $100 million, billion dollar business of like building a relationship with every single customer. But I think it's like building relationships with these people, making them customers. And then like there's compounding effects in terms of doing right by people. Like I, I think for me, I'm curious if you feel similarly, like one of my benchmarks for knowing if I'm like on the right path as far as product is like, are my customers referring other people because they're so happy with what I'm doing for them? Like we've had a lot of success with customers not even having a referral deal in place. Like, oh, hey, I want you to meet this person because you've solved this pain point for me and I think you can do it for them as well. Yeah, I think our, when, when Verbatim started like a year and a half ago, I think we can track like 60% of all revenue from uh, Scott Sonborn at Tido and <laughs> Ken Davison at Skio, which I know you know. Yeah. And it was just The because, two of them have just been referral machines? Uh, I mean, again, refer one person, then we do good work for the next person, they refer more. But when you can really trace things back to, again, we're bootstrapped, different vision, but like a handful of relationships that you, you just become genuine friends. Um, and you, again, you don't have to work together forever, but I think that really does matter. And I'm sure you in like three years with Platter will look back and be like, oh, that person that I met at this event that I really just wanted to become friends with and you became friends with, I'm sure that'll track back to hundreds of customers over time. Yeah, that's the goal. And I think the other thing for us too is because we've been very narrow focused to date with what we've been building, there's a lot of marketing strategies that I have like curiosities about, but it will really be like testing and iterating very quickly before like leaning into something and scaling it. Because I haven't like tried enough uh, in the current brand in terms of what I think will work for us at scale. I'm curious, we talked about what you've had to sacrifice like as a, operator basically like what habits you've had to give up or change in your approach personally what have you had to sacrifice aside from just vacation um, but maybe it's like hey you said you work till like eight or nine and you're waking up at eight that only gives you a few hours at night like what are you sacrificing on the personal side of things i don't feel like i'm sacrificing anything to be honest mm. like to me the way i see it is i'm living my dream right i've had this dream since i was basically a kid so i don't I feel like I'm only really winning. I've never, I've never felt like I was sacrificing anything. Do you feel like you're exactly where you want to be right now? Uh, no. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, definitely, I definitely wish I was. I, I definitely always think I'm behind and I yeah. need to like move ahead. You know, I think the only thing I probably sacrifice was my health at some point which mm -hmm. i realized was a mistake so that's something that i've 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 um uh, i've sort of course corrected on but no otherwise i never you know i think something that's helped me is i was always a very hard worker from a young age i was always very competitive from when i was an actual child so when, from when i was like eight nine ten years old i was just always very ambitious and so to me, I, I, I've never had to really shift the way I worked. I've had to shift the things I worked on and my priorities. I'm curious, dude, that, that line that you just said resonated so strongly with me of, I feel like I'm always behind and I feel like I need to move forward or push faster. This goes back to the question that I always ask. This is one of my favorite questions to ask on the podcast. Uh, what do you think are the three most common traits of high performers? Of high performers? I think it's important to have a, ch a chip on your shoulder. I mean, you obviously need a lot of ambition. So to a point where it's almost delusional, where you think you can create, you have to believe that you can create a reality that is different from the one that exists today. And that requires a lot of tenacity, a lot of vision, a lot of ambition, and just you have to, you have to be willing to make sacrifices. I think for the reason I asked that question, I was like scrolling TikTok months ago and a video that I came across that I've heard multiple times that like it, it stuck with me because of like this conversation yeah. is that one of the most common uh, traits of high performers is the feeling of inadequacy, mm. which is why like when you say that I laugh because it's just this notion of like I, I need to do a little more. I'm not where I want to be. And every time you level up in the game, call it the game of life, like 
in your mind, now it's time to get to the next level, the next level. So the fact that you never feel like you've made it is the reason that you're pushing so much further than some other people could ever imagine. Yeah, I don't personally feel like there's anything wrong with me for not being where I want to be. But if I'm just objective about it, there are companies, there are people who have better metrics than I do. And so when I see that, I realize, okay, there are things about the world and there are things about business or there are things about myself that I have yet to learn. And that's why I'm not there yet. I'm not like moving at, I, at sort of the speed I want to be going at. But do you think there's a final destination? Because like I love, I love hearing when you, you see someone who's like called, called 60 years old, who's built 10 businesses, has million, hundreds of millions of dollars, and they're like, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Yeah, I don't think there's a final destination. It's more just this con- constant iterative cycle where you're, there's a, I think the Stripe founders talk about this. There's, there's a book called uh, Finite and Infinite Games, or maybe it's the reverse, it's I don't know. Infinite Games, yeah. Is it just Infinite Games? I think so. Okay, so that book basically speaks of that concept where you want to be playing an infinite game, a game that has no end, and the point of the game is just being in the game. So I think it's, it's kind of like that. I think, I think I need to read this book. What's it called? I think is infinite. it just Infinite Games? I think so. Maybe it's an... I'm not sure. Yeah. Sounds like a book something, that would be good for me. Something about <laughs> games. <laughs> picture yeah. book? Yeah, I don't care what it is. I'm, um, what you said right there is... I, I, I feel it deeply of like... We're, I'm not moving as fast as I want to be, or I'm not where I want to be. But so, where do you want to be? Where's what's the gap between where you are now and where you want to be? I mean, business should be four times bigger, growing much faster with like key senior senior leadership in place. So yeah, what but do you what, need to what's do your to get ba- there? what's yeah. your basis for feeling that way? Because I hang out with you guys all the time. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like if you get if your business four X's and you have these key leadership people, we're gonna be sitting here again in twelve months and be like my business should have been sold already for like a billion dollars, whatever. Right. So it's, I, yeah, I want to like, I want to challenge you a little bit on that notion. Is it just, you always wanted to be a little bit better. You actually feel like you've fallen short of where you want to be being realistic, it's not but that's the word. Down. I think that's actually the hard word to bring into this context is the word of being realistic. I think the yeah. reason that we do the things that we do to a point you made earlier is like you have unrealistic expectations but and here's you manifest thing, that though, into reality. Right? Here's the thing about being realistic. I really believe that if this is more true of, say, uh, business than I think, say, like basket, like playing the NBA or something. But I really believe that if especially in business, if someone else has figured it out, then it's just and you haven't, then that means that you're you're still being realistic. Right. It's like these $10 billion companies do exist. It's not like they're, it's not like they're not out there. And so there is a path that you can reverse engineer that can get you to where you want to be. 